everyone this is abhinav agarwal your host from the indic book club and welcome to our latest uh, iteration of the indic book club's writers open house with otis hashmeyer and for those of you who are joining for the first time what we uh, uh, and i'm sure you would have read the the post on indic academy laying out uh, how you're supposed to interact and all but for those who are joining in uh, for the first time so we invite you to to send your writing sample approximately 800 words in length uh, to the email id provided and uh, uh, provided you send it uh, well in advance to give otis time to review it and send us feedback what we do is first of all otis marks it up with his comments and he'll send it back uh, he'll send the pdf back to you and then in this session we uh you know he takes up as many writing samples as he can within the time that's uh, uh you know that, that's available to us and uh, and covers you know the principles of good writing and gives specific feedback to the person uh, or persons so with that i will turn it over to you otis okay thank you okay i uh maybe we could get everyone on the on the video that would be great correct so i'm doing that and people uh, as you become a panelist you will be able to unmute yourself and you will be able to share your webcam so when you're you know if i i would suggest and encourage all of you to keep your webcams on so that we can see each other but certainly when uh, uh, you know your writing sample is being discussed i would definitely uh, you know request you to switch on your <clears throat> webcam and all the attendees are now panelists. Okay, great. Uh great to see you all. Good morning or good after, good evening for all of you or many of you. Um so I have uh I have a number of pieces. I think uh we should just start. I think my first piece um is uh is Ram's piece and uh let me share that screen. Um Let's see if my let me know if my my screen shares with you. Oh, not yet. We can see your screen with a, a numbered list there. Uh I I I suppose it's an appendix describing some of the terms used in a sample. Oh yeah, I got that. That was very helpful for me actually. I appreciate that whoever sent that to me. a glossary. I'm sorry, I'll try let me try again. Or maybe I'll should stop my share. I'm going to try again. Hello everyone. Um, <clears throat> did, uh, I'm sorry. I'm having some kind of little issue here. a lot uh let me try a different way so i'm trying to connect up my ipad but it seems to have been having a little trouble let me try and see if i can do it through here Yeah, okay, you have and Ram, this is your piece that you're looking at? Yeah. Yeah. Let me just okay. I, I don't know. I don't have the handy dandy use of my my eye pencil so much, so um we'll have to make do without it, I guess. Um Let's see. And then when I move it, does it move? Yeah, it does. Okay. Uh if you could just uh uh read between these two blue marks that i have here that would be great yeah i'll uh, do that before that uh, otis just one one uh, question how many 
pieces did you get and how many are you uh, do you think you, you would be able to cover in a uh, in approximately the next 80 an hour and 20 minutes that we have yeah i think i have um i think i have six pieces and uh, i'm gonna hope to cover all of them i'm not gonna okay. I'm, I'm gonna try as opposed to last time i'm gonna try not to just you know talk so much about a single piece i'm gonna try and move on a little bit more quickly Okay, so uh, I'll I'll do I'll I'll you know don the mantle of the timekeeper. So uh, between ten and fifteen minutes, I'll do a quick time check. Okay, and and so Ram, is that that's your background noise probably since you have your your mic mic on. So that that's fine. We 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 want you to be able to talk. So I just was worried if it was someone else. Okay, Ram, could you read those, that short section? Sure, I'll do that. Uh, so I'll start, I'll read the blue section. It's a Friday evening and three friends are gathered at the harbor bar of the Taj Mahal Palace Hotel in Mumbai. All of you know Linda, whose, name, whose full name is Elma Linda Fernandez Makimane. Some of you know me, Ram, full name Ramanjane Tyagarajan Sharaf. None of you know Amit Gupta, full name uh, Amit Gupta. We hope that Khub Jamega Ran, Jab Mil Baithenge Teen Yaar, Linda, Ram or Amit, no, it doesn't rhyme. Everything in life doesn't have to. We hope that us three, Linda, Ram and Amit, would have a good time together as the familiar Hindi ad jingle for back paper whiskey set. The sound of the motorboat oil covered sea slapping on the retaining wall was blocked out by the floor to ceiling sealed glass windows. The stale air circulated by the central air conditioning was a refreshing change from the freshly skewed carbon monoxide outside. A taxi driver honked angrily in the street, but we only heard the soft clinking of ice in cut whiskey glasses as the immaculately dressed waiter dropped clear ice cubes into them. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Ram, could you tell us a little bit about what, what your intention is with this? Yeah, uh, so I was actually, I'm actually part of a writer's, uh, writer's uh, uh, WhatsApp group that was for the NaNoWriMo. And uh, then uh, I have a, a little bit of an odd name and somebody else on the group also happened to have a little bit of a interesting name. So there was a small discussion around names and uh, this piece was actually inspired by that. So the names in this are real, except Amit Gupta, who is of course fictional. Uh, so that is what inspired this. So which is why, uh, so the piece is actually sort of speaking to the members of that group. And I had also recently started reading Moby Dick again. And Moby Dick starts with the epic line, call me Ishmael. It is not I am Ishmael, call me Ishmael. So I really thought that that spoke to the reader. So I thought, why don't I experiment with something like that? And that's why I said, I will speak to the reader and say that let's imagine the setting. So that's like sort of the little bit background okay. for this. Right, okay, great. Um, so you have Moby Dick, call me Ishmael. It was one of the most noticeable things. So so maybe maybe this time, you know, Ram, you've come a few times. What what do you think it what do you think it does to the audience when they're addressed? I think when the audience is addressed subconsciously, the audience becomes part of the process. I mean, they are already drawn in because the book is speaking with them. They're having a con as opposed to receiving information from the book. Uh, the, uh, the text on the page is asking them to do something, right? Like call me Ishmael. So there is already a conversation that is going on between the reader and the pages of the book. So I think when, uh, so okay. yeah. Okay, that's uh, <laughs> it's interesting because I think my take is 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 the opposite. Um, oh, okay. So no, no, but I I mean I understand you're saying that, and so uh -huh. it just makes me sort of interested in the different ways that we're looking at what it means to be drawn in. Right. Um. So there's there's this the willing. So we. Like in writing, we talk about the reader's willing suspension of disbelief. So right. this is willing suspension of disbelief. I think we should, we need to dwell on that a little bit. We don't want to rush to conclusions about what disbelief means. Mm -hmm. For me, what it means is that the moment, right, we cannot control the reader mm. in any way before they arrive and open our book. Right. Of I mean, course. marketers try to and, and, and publishers try to. Absolutely. But the willing suspension of 
the, the willing suspension of disbelief for me is that moment when we open the, open the book, the reader reads the first word, the first sentence, the first paragraph. Right. When they, when they open the book, they're basically willing to do anything with mm -hmm. us. They're mm -hmm. basically expressing their willingness to do something with us, and they will do it to the moment that they don't feel satisfied and included. Basically. Sure. Of course. So this is, we actually have a couple pieces here uh, this week where, I'm not sure, you know, it might be just two, but maybe three, where the reader is addressed. Here we have a we. Mm -hmm. um, in another piece, we have a you. Mm -hmm. So for me, and again, it's probably just a nuance, but this is just my belief system. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can think about it. When I'm addressed, when I'm addressed, I'm aware of myself. Mm -hmm. I'm aware in a sense that I exist. Right. However, there is a moment, there's a moment in the willing suspension of disbelief when I begin reading where I'm willing to completely uh, subsume myself mm -hmm. in favor of whatever consciousness I get drawn into. So what okay. happens to me when I become addressed is I become aware of myself and actually so remember, remember the whole, you know, I've gone on about this for a while. Like if we move the reader towards monotony mm. or confusion, yeah. in a sense, what happens when we move them out of our world, which mm -hmm. let's say the world is that central place, that central consciousness. Mm -hmm. When we, when we confuse them or we give them so much monotony that they can't take it anymore. What mm -hmm. happens, you know, I've said that, you know, the reader, right. You know, we have this one, the reader drops the book, right. They, they leave the story, mm. but what, what is happening when they leave the story? What's happening when they leave the story is they become conscious of themselves. That mm. is the key. This, to me, is like the key thing that happens. We move them to confusion. They do not like being in a state of confusion. They do mm -hmm. not like being in a state of monotony. They, they therefore flee the world and arrive at a consciousness of themselves. And then they start thinking, oh, my God, I need to do my laundry. Oh, my God, I need to, <laughs> I need to do the dishes. You know, mm -hmm. it's that it's so like I'm just trying to mark that that those stages. Mm -hmm. So, excuse me, I put this up. Um, the, I like to treat my books well um, for the most part. Um, so what we have when we address the reader is we mm -hmm. actually – retain that awareness of self, if mm -hmm. this makes sense, and we never completely drop them into the world when we have the chance. Right? Mm -hmm. So like even though even though so you bring up one maybe the most famous line in uh, American <laughs> literature, call me Ishmael. Right. Which is which is an address. So you have you you like caught me. Ah you know I I'm a bit bound by this. Um, I'm going to imagine, okay, and I, I will tell you the truth. I did not finish Moby Dick. I did not read it for a class. Okay. okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you that I read it when I was, I guess I was probably, you know, 13 or 12 or 13, you know, when I was mm -hmm. given that book and mm -hmm. I read a lot of it, but I guess, I, I guess I'm, I'm going to get to the, I'll tell you that I read to the point where they talked about whale rendering whale blubber for 40 pages. Okay, so okay. at that point, the monotony got That's to me, approach. right? Okay. The monotony got to me. Okay. But, but I think, but what I really want to say is that, you know, call me Ishmael, that as the first line mm -hmm. does make me somewhat aware. The question mm -hmm. for me would be, like, if I were evaluating that book now, mm -hmm. do I... Is that a handicap that the book finally overcomes? Hmm. Okay. So, like, to me, that's a handicap. Okay. Because, because, uh, I, I mean, I would have, I would have said, I would have said my advice now to, to Melville, and I'm sure, you know, what, how can I do such a thing? I would say begin in media race, right? Hmm. I'm pretty sure that um, at the beginning of Moby Dick, uh, the Ishmael character, the narrator, walks in and has to sleep in that rooming house with Queequeg, mm -hmm. right? 
that's a great scene. He has to get into bed with Quee Quick. Mm. It's amazing. You know, this person that he describes as a cannibal, you know, as a savage, you know, who appears to him in that way. Right. And then he's going to end up being the person with humanity on that boat. Right. So um, I would say start there Mm -hmm. because the reason being, you know, I walked into the rooming house and saw a man, you know, blah, 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 and then had the descriptions Mm -hmm. of Queequeg. If you start there, if I've opened the book Mm -hmm. and I read, I walked in, what I do is I become the I character. That is a closer association than me being a person who is being asked to call him Ishmael. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so these, this is a, this might sound like for all of you writers, you might be like, please, you know, tell me something more basic than this, you know, or like, you know, give me some advice I can use. But I think that this is really the foundation. This is where the strongest writing comes from, is understanding this little point. Mm-hmm. That the reader wants to, wants to come into the world and wants mm-hmm. to participate in it. So mm-hmm. I go back to the idea, the reader wants to have an experience, not read about one. This is, to me, this is the core of my philosophy in, mm-hmm. in writing and writing effectively, mm-hmm. is that we basically use what the what the reader already is bringing us, their desire to go into our world and be someone else and have an experience. And we use that to, to our purpose in a sense, or we use it, we use it with them together. Okay. So this is it's, interesting. A little okay. bit, it's a little mm-hmm. bit like, uh, like I think about it as a physical, it's like writing is a kind of a keto. If you know, a keto and, you know, there are a lot of martial arts, but I'm just using this one as an example because this is the one I understand. Mm-hmm. But anyway, in Aikido, you have the, you know, the forces come. Here's the writer, the Aikido master, we imagine. And here's the reader, right? They come at us like this. They want, mm-hmm. ah, and we do, we take what they're already giving us and we bring them this way. Okay. Right? We, we work with them. We don't mm-hmm. go like this. Hey, listen, you need to, uh, there's some things you need to understand first and blah, 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 blah. We mm-hmm. do not work them. Of course. We use their natural, you know, what we, we use what they're bringing to us. And what mm-hmm. they're bringing to us is two things. The desire to go into our world and the desire to have an experience that's like their experience, right. but better, but better. That's really key, mm-hmm. right? Um <laughs> you know, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Philip, Philip K. Dick, right? We, we quoted him before. He's like, writing's easy. I just leave out all the boring parts. So that's what I mean by <laughs> it. Like, it's like their life, right? They experience it like their life emotionally with, mm-hmm. emotion, with emotions that go up and down, okay? Just like right. that. We okay. do not live in a monotone experience. Mm. We live in an, emotional, an, an emotionally modulated experience that makes us feel like we're existing in time because mm-hmm. of the change of emotion. So we take our writing, we do the same thing, mm-hmm. but we make it better than their life because their life is actually monotonous often and right. confusing often, of right? Course. So they're so they're looking for that they're looking for mm-hmm. that sanctuary space that's in in the middle. Right. And what we do in our work is we provide it. So essentially what you're saying is that by addressing the reader, I am making the reader aware of his existence as a separate entity from my work. And we don't want that. We want him to be part of the work. We don't want him to be separate. We don't want him to be different. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. Yes. Yes. And if you can make the reader feel like they're not separate, Mm -hmm. now you are doing some amazing, you're not only doing amazing, amazing writing, I think, but you're also basically fulfilling the contract and the promise of the story itself. Mm-hmm. The contract of the story itself is that the reader has come to you to escape their life right. and enter your world. Right. And that's what I want. Right. <laughs> you know, like that. I mean, I'm just uh, speaking speaking for myself. But that's why that's why because I'm making a choice, right? Mm. The way I look at it is completely logical, and every reader is making a choice. They're making the choice not to do their dishes 
not of to course. talk to their kids, of not course. to do all the projects that they want to do, not mm. to advance their careers, not to blah, blah, blah. They're not going to do any of that. Why? Because that's difficult and hard. Right? Well, this is interesting. This is, this what you're saying is interesting. Uh. Yeah. It, if, if we get that, if, if we take this concept, this single concept, right? And it, right. It, it's the one that drives all of my work. Now, it, right. not always effectively, because there's many times that I want to come in and I want to mm. tell the reader what to think. I mm. want to direct them. I want to mm. uh, outwardly manipulate them. Right. Right. Uh, I want to bully them, etc. You know, I I want to do all those things just like every human being does. Right. I want to be I want to be heard. Mm -hmm. I want everyone to applaud me. I want to be <laughs> uh, the person who I want to be the writer who has written rather mm. than doing the hard work of writing. Right. But in writing, I have to work with this this notion that mm. I have of the reader, and the thing is, I'm okay with it. Because I don't think that I'm somehow better than the reader. That reader is just like me. Just like mm -hmm. when I read Moby Dick. Right. When I read Moby Dick, I was like, call me Ishmael. I had nothing to feel about that. Okay. But I had a lot to, I had a lot to feel when Ishmael gets into bed with Queequeg. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you. I was, I was like, I felt a lot. I was a 13-year-old boy. You know, mm -hmm. I was thinking about how it would be if I got into bed with Queequeg. Right. right? That's what I thought. Okay. Right. I identified with Ishmael and I got into bed with Queequeg. That oh, was, you know, but oh, when we got to 40 pages of blubber rendering, I was like, <laughs> why am I still here? Yeah, I, 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 I lost that, that too. I, the author lost me there. But what you're saying is profound, right? Because so what you're saying is that as a writer, my competition is not other writers. My competition is the reader's life. I'm competing for his time with everything oh, else he's doing. Thank you. That's beautifully put. Yes. Interesting. My, your competition is the reader's life. Yeah. Yes. This is profound. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna jot that down. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm gonna jot that down. That's well said. <laughs> And now I'm going to have the trouble of quoting you and having your, your full name. I'm going to be like, this, yes, the competition, <laughs> is not other writers. The, yeah. the other writers. <clears throat> uh, Otis, quick time check. Yeah. Okay, great. Let me just, quick. let me uh, continue with this for a moment. Um, I, there, there's a consistent theme in all of our work always, and we'll always come back to it, is basically uh, propose basically putting on the page the conflict, mm. right? We've talked about this every time and we will probably yeah. talk about it every time. Right. Who is the protagonist? Who is the antagonist? Those two coming together is the frame of the story. It right. creates the problem that we are looking at. Yeah. So we need, we need to be aware of that and feel that. And yeah. then the second most important thing is that we need to actually take a side. We call mm. taking the side the mm. force of protagonism. The, mm. the force of protagonist protect the two sides are equal, but we live through the protagonist side, mm -hmm. and therefore we care about what happens to the protagonist. But I'm going to say something else that's also very important. And so anyway, I don't feel that in this piece. We always want to force ourselves to do that. That will save us so much time right. if we identify those those two forces. If we don't identify those two forces. If we think that we've gone into our piece, and this has to do with other pieces that we're looking at today too, if we've gone into our piece and we don't have in our mind these identified two forces, mm -hmm. then, um, well, then that's going to be a problem. It's actually, okay. it's actually going to mean that it's actually going to mean, from my point of view, that we don't have a story. Right. And if we don't have a story, we're not using the mechanism that we have found in you know in thousands of years that works um, right so then 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 once we have that then we also have a resolution but mm, if we don't course. have if we don't have this to start with then we can't have a resolution either of course and i just want to i want to say another thing that is important to always keep in mind when i bring up protagonism and antagonism basically the story 
is going to examine the protagonist. Okay, mm. it's not it, we don't write a story so that the protagonist can beat the crap out of the antagonist. Okay, right. bomb, 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 bomb. That is not the point of the story. That was that's what um, I think it's Aristotle. He calls imitative fallacy. Mm-hmm. Okay, the point of the story is to shed a light on the protagonist. They mm-hmm. are the subject. They are the one who takes the journey. They are the ones who ch- achieve enlightenment, and that's the movement of the story. So, th- those things are also missing. But I, but really, I wanted to make the point about the. Um, okay, Avatans is. I like this Avatans. You, I, I. It's useful to me to have a clock on. <laughs> you can tell, right? Of course. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Ram. Um, I just have one very little question. So, can I send you poetry submissions? Poetry? Yep. Well, I I have written some poetry, and I and even even published poetry. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I I like looking at poetry. I, I love poetry. Okay. So I'll send you some. I think I sent you, but I don't know if it didn't reach you. I'll send you something next time. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your feedback. Very useful. Uh, one question okay. I had to ask. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so, um, can I se- suppose I had sent one article, one sample before, and you had corrected it? Can I make those changes and send it over the same sample again in the ne- next, the next for the next session? Um, yeah, I think so. If you like, because I have some, some confusion regarding the point of view regarding to two characters, so I want to just check with you again whether I'm putting in uh, understanding the right way or not. Because yes, uh, few I, of the stories have the two two the like point of view question is coming up while I'm editing writing them actually. Yeah, if you if you have a, also if you have a specific question that you'd like me to look at and try and address, that would be helpful. Like for example, if you're talking about point of view, you could say I tried to focus the point of view on this character. You know, was I successful? You know, where was I and where wasn't I? And that that'll that'll help me address the the issue that you want to look at the most rather than once again review the piece as a whole which i yes, yes. You know, yes, sure. i have like one or two stories which i have many points of view i'm completely confused when editing them which is which, I, which which one i should keep first and which one i should remove so i'm completely confused there so i will work on them and just send it back to you right so so if you have a story with multiple points of view as as i said so Let's go back to protagonist and antagonist just for a minute, right? The story is about the protagonist. They are the ones that we bring as narrator. We test them. We test them. We break them down. We force them to go to their, you know, essential selves. We uh, destroy all their vanities and presumptions. And then from that place, like a phoenix rising from the flame, they... They, they achieve some kind of enlightenment. That's the movement of the story. So the way to figure out who's the protagonist is also the, you doing some thinking about who is going to change. Right. But it's also, but now you'll notice people something. People changing at the same time. <clears throat> but you'll notice something in balance with that. Yeah. If, if this protagonist is going to change, that means here they need to change. Right. Okay. So we, you know, um, we do not have the, the protagonist does not begin the story enlightened and then leave enlightened, right? Because if there's no change that, that uh, violates our law of monotony and, <laughs> you know, a lack of movement, you know, they were, they were enlightened and perfect here and they're enlightened and perfect there. Okay. That's not how that that if we want to write an effective story, we don't do it that way. Okay. Right. But in because the sense the that uh, the antagonist can be a situation, not necessarily it it has to be a person, right? It has to be a protagonistic force. Yeah, yeah, the protagonist. So that can be, it. And the, anti- has, and the the opposing force can be a person or a situation. It can be both, either of them. The opposing force, you know, because we like to dramatize, we like to have an opposing force that's somehow realizable and concrete, like a person. That's why we do it. 
But the opposing force is really the entire world. The antagonistic force is the world. So it's the individual will, the individual will versus the world. That's the basic, the basis of story. So, but whatever, so when you say, you, when you say, does it have to be a person? Maybe yes. The point is, it has to be an individual will. If there's no will, if the, if the individual, the protagonist does not want something, trying to get something, then they also cannot be thwarted, right, by the antagonistic force. So, so, if it, if, if, so like, for example, let's say we have someone in complete peace with themselves and enlightened. Well, they don't have any problems. They, they, they can't have an antagonistic force. It's only through will that we have antagonism. Okay. So, so it doesn't matter whether it's a tree, but if it's a tree, it still has to have a will. Okay. Um, no, one yeah. most, right. One of the most famous, and, and our antagonist, our antagonistic force kind of has to have a will too. One of the most famous uh, depictions of this, actually for me, is a nonfiction book called Into Thin Air by um, Krakauer. I forget his first name right John now. John Krakauer, but, I think. John Krakauer. So what he does is we actually need this sense of will from both sides, right? So like, you know, Superman wants to save the world and save these poor, weak mortals or whatever. And um, whoever, Dr. Evil, wants to destroy the world, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, so that, that's helpful. But like in Krakauer's book, he had, he had Krakauer and these people, this kind of ragtag group. They're the protagonists who mm -hmm. want to climb Everest. But then he says something about Everest that I'll never forget. He said, Everest makes its own weather. Wow. Okay. So that, that's as if Everest has volition. Put that in your head. As if Everest has volition. So we need volition on both sides. They want to climb Everest, and Everest also has volition. It likes to do things its way. I will say... It's arguable that Everest is not making its weather, right? Everest is just a big mountain of which weather patterns move up and then consolidate and pressurize. I don't want to get into meteorology. I know very little about it. But it's arguable that Everest doesn't make the weather. But Krakauer is a great storyteller. He knows that you make the antagonistic force have volition. He knows it's better to have Dr. Evil than ubiquitous evil that exists in the world, right? That and, is more you vague. Know this. That would be more vague. A situation would be more vague. A person would be more concrete. Right. And, and basically, our job, when we're story writers, we are dramatists. Drama we dramatize. So we might say that it's an abstract struggle against whatever the abstract struggle it's really the abstract struggle against the individual and the rest of the world as i've said not it is not an abstract struggle of good against evil i'm going to say that because i don't believe that but it is the individual uh ego in a sense versus the world that's the abstract struggle that we dramatize through characters okay Thank you. I, at, least, at least that's what I, that's what makes sense to me, and I'm just trying my best to figure out how to write good stories. So that's and that also gives um, a structure to the story. You would say what's that? That 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 also helps to give a structure to the story, as uh, you would say that uh, that the that, that is the structure of a story. Right. From my point of view, lacking that. We do not have a story, we have typing. Not to be too mm -hmm. blunt about it. Or we have something that wants to be a story by being typing first, and then we take the typing and we develop these things out of it. You know, right. yes. If, if, if we don't have those things, I don't call it a story. A story is a, is a thing that exists. Framed, two things, boom, head somewhere. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Abhinav is giving me the nod, move on. Um, okay, let's take a look at this. Did uh, children's fantasy come up? Uh, 
sorry, Otis, what's the question? Uh, did, do you have a, did my shared screen come up with children's Yeah, yeah, it did, series? it did. Okay, great. Okay, let's just have, read this first part. Um, Abhinav? Okay, sure. So, <clears throat> uh, how much more a voice spoke a voice spoke up from the back seat of the car for the tenth time and half as many minutes. A little more, the voice from the driver's seat replied for the tenth time. You said that like half an hour ago, Dhruv remonstrated. After all, if it was a little more half an hour ago, it should be a little less now, not a little more. You should have said it was a lot more then. I forgot Beta side prana from the front. It's a little more. How can one forget Pa? You have maps open on your phone. Ma, don't you? You could tell him. Nah, Dhruv turned his attention to the passenger in the front seat. What I think you have forgotten is that eating three chocolates is not going to do you or your teeth any good. It's all that sugar that has made you so hyperactive. Aparna snapped with some irritation. A little more chocolate and you will have a lot less teeth, a lot more painful injections in the gums and a lot more fillings from the dentist. Get it? Thank you. Uh, very amusing piece. Um, so, uh, so uh, Abhinav, is, it, is Abhinav, you, you prefer that? I, I think our emails, it's Avatans, but Abhinav is uh, first name? So, Av so uh, Avatans is another person. He's, uh, he might have interacted oh. with you in a, in, in a different context. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we, we are two <laughs> different individuals. <laughs> you try to do to me come on <laughs> all right okay so i'm going to stick with uh, avatan okay and and we're, i'm gonna avatan uh abhanav is not here anyway um okay good to know thank you uh so <clears throat> this i know that <clears throat> sorry excuse me uh i know you've talked about sharing pieces maybe in some kind of group and um I think that that would be a great thing if if we begin to develop that, even if not everyone in the group. I I I love things to stay very casual so that people can drop in and you know do what they want and what they have time for. We have to obviously take care of our time and take care of the rest of the world, not just our writing. It's difficult, but um, but if you do that, that would be great because this is a this is a piece that I would love to offer up to the group to to start talking about because. I did find when I did workshops, one of the things that was most helpful for me, actually, I tried to listen to the professor, right? But, you know, I have my problem with authority. What, what worked the best for me was when I read things and I had reactions and then I would say things and whether they were right or not about the other person's work, I then had to sort of represent <laughs> that for my own work, right? I'd be like, uh, you know, this has four points of view and I was really not able to center myself in it and, and find out, you know, who it was that I was rooting for. And then, then I was like, well, now I have to write something without four points of view. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll just put that out there as something maybe we can we continue to think about developing, you know, the ability to read right. each other's pieces. Um, this, uh, so there are a couple of things on the, you know, the, just my, my, my hit list, basically. I, I always will suggest that when you begin your work, because we know that we have, need to have a protagonist and an antagonist, and we know we need to draw the reader into our world, for that reason, I say that we need to um, establish the setting and establish the point of view and <laughs> we have to do a lot of things in the beginning of our story and establish the conflict. Um, this story, and, and so, and now, and when, once we've done that too, now that we've established that point of view, we think, what is it that the point, we need to know basically in a very overt way, what the point of view wants. The reason we need to know that in an overt way is because the, the process of the story is the protagonist not getting what they want. I'm, I'm pounding my knee, if you can't tell, on my concrete floor, not getting what they want. That's what keeps us turning the pages. Because our question is, will they get what they want? It is that 
basic. Um, so in this story, this story is wonderfully well written in a lot of ways. But it does not allow that. And that's, that becomes a major problem. So which is, which is really like, <clears throat> you can write a lot less well than this and write a story that's more effective because of this issue, right? This is really interesting to us. It doesn't, you know, we can write something that's, I mean, we can be a, an amazing writer. We can have, you know, we, you know, we, we just, each of these characters is delineated, but the experience of having a story, the experience of me wondering what's going to happen is not there. So I might not even, I, I, I probably would not turn the page. I, I, if I were reading this for a journal, and this is the writing quality here for me is journal, journal writing quality. If I were reading for a journal, however, as soon as I saw that we were not defining who the protagonistic force was, I would also know that there's not going to be any outcome. Those things go hand in hand for me. And so hmm. because my time is short reading, I would put it aside. I would say, I would say that this writer is a, a gifted writer. You know, they, they're clearly able to, you know, bring up, see, uh, defining the point of view, sticking to the point of view, developing the emotional modulation. These are all skills we can learn once well, we in... realize we need to. So in, the, in, in this piece, for example, then, uh, let, let's, you know, if you can take maybe a, just a couple of paragraphs. So if uh, this were to be rewritten with a more consistent point of view, uh, uh, you know, how would that be? Because uh, I'm assuming that if uh, this is the omniscient narrator's point of view, uh, would this fit or, or you know? <clears throat> so... So we have, we have what we call omniscient point of view. But what we right. really do in our writing is we want to have omniscient, a, a limited omniscient point of view. So that hmm. means we're writing in third person, but we're really, um, we're really honing in on one character. So I'm going to go back. Let me go back to this idea of um, we're in competition with the reader's life. Okay, so we're in competition with the reader's life. Um, the reader, <clears throat> we want to draw them into this world. We want to have a more exciting version of life in this isolated place. But we want it to seem like life, right, of the, of the reader, right? So we have to, we are working with two things. We need to exclude confusion and monotony the boring stuff and the confusing stuff. And we want to have an emotionally modulated experience like real life, but with those parts taken out. So now we have a condensed, um, concentrated version of exciting, emotionally evocative life, right? The reader only experiences life, I've said this before, the reader only experiences life in one point of view. Correct. This is the world that they know. They do not know a world, no matter how much they claim to, I'm going to argue, <laughs> just like I will argue about Everest, no matter how much a person claims to understand the world in multiple points of view, they don't. I, that's my argument. They know the world in one point of view. So if we put them into a world in which they have four different points of view, when an omniscient narrator, what we're really doing is we're not, we're not creating something that's like their life with another character that's like their life. We're actually drawing them into the experience of an omniscient narrator. And the omniscient narrator without limitation is like going into the eye of God. Right. When the human right. being... When a human being goes into the eye of God, and I'm just talking about it abstractly, but when, it, when a human being goes into true omniscience, of course they will go mad. We cannot know all things. We're not capable of it. 
our, our physical life forbids us our ability. So <clears throat> I'm sort of overstating that, but my point is we're not, we don't want to be talking about real omniscience, okay? Because right. the, the human being, so while the narrator can do this, yes, the narrator can go into all these minds, the, the human being, the reader is not really comfortable there, hmm. right? They're not really comfortable there. So what we want is we want to have, if we're going to have omniscience, if we're going to have third person, we want to have limited omniscience. And what I would suggest is that we focus on uh, one point of view, or if we have a longer work, sometimes we'll, we will have multiple points of view. But we want to understand, we always want to understand everything that we write. What, what is our base? Our base is to take this reader and put him into this world and by God keep him there. Okay, that's our base. So, so now we might say, well, I really want to have another point of view because it works for my plot or it works for my story or it's just easier, right? We say that, mm -hmm. it's, and it is easy. It's really easy for us as writers to imagine that we know other people's points of view without doing any of the work, the real work, right? So we might say that, but what is the cost? This is going back to, I mean, I, I don't like to reduce things into a, you know, a, a ratio of cost and benefit, but like, okay, so there's a benefit to going into multiple points of view, but what's the cost? And is the cost, is the cost <laughs> going to be that? This is what we're dealing with. We want to think hard about that. That's what I say. Like, like, we want to think really hard about that. We do not want to take the easy route. Hmm. Okay. And, and this goes back, this goes to another thing. You know, uh, we think, and this is why I love writing. Writing is hard. When you know what's really at stake, when you really want to write well, you have to understand that writing is hard. If, we, if it were easy, honestly, everyone would be doing it. Right? I mean, we can all type, so we would all be doing it. But it's really hard to make these choices. Um, this is the level of work that we have to start involving ourselves in, those kinds of questions. While it's easy to go into multiple points of view, while it's easy to, right, when I was in college, it was hard to type five pages. Right. It's not hard for me to type five pages now. So what is it hard for me to do? Right. Figuring out how to tell it's not it's not a um, I guess what I'm but but my main thing is I'm trying to say that writing a story, which is what we're after, is a known quantity, I think. And we can raise our level to do it if we know that we have to raise our level to that. I mean, this is like what we're doing here is like a serious boot camp. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bullshitting you at all. As far as I'm telling you exactly what I feel, right, and exactly how I, you know, how I think about it. No, this, is, this, plenty... this is yeah, this yeah. is interesting. Uh, a couple of uh, lines of thought have started to emerge. I think I'm. I'm... For well, the next couple of weeks, I'm, I'm going to try something and see if I can uh, send uh, uh, send something to you. This is what I really suggest. Oh, I really suggest that you try something. Yes. Try an experiment. Try an experiment. Because if you start at least by establishing the setting, right? So that we need this world. Where's this world? We're in a car. It's not exactly the most exciting setting. I'm just going to say that. So like, you know what? Someone... Well, I, I'm just going to put that aside for a second. Yes, just try it. This is this is actually what started. I mean, I I imagined I was a writer from the time I was 12, right? So, but I didn't really pursue it. And then I wrote a story that I thought was so smart, so brilliant. And I went to a workshop. It was in Bennington, Vermont, and there was an author there who I still know, Barry Hanna, and I will tell you some stories about him. And he said that my story meandered like a drunk on a bender. That's what he said about my story. 
Ouch. Instead of meandering like a drunk on a bender. I won't use the, I mean, and, when, and I was like, and I said to him, I, I like, I was an aggressive kid, you know? I came up to him and I was like, listen, I don't mind you criticizing my work, but I don't like you getting a good line at my expense, right? <laughs> but of course, that's all that writers want to do. Writers always want to get a good line at other people's expense. So I was, I was not, I was not in my league. But what I said was, what I said in that workshop, but I said, screw it. He's saying to do this and this. And this is where, this has been my strength, is that I can listen to what people say. And I can take it in slowly, slowly, and not without some pushback, but I take it in. And so I did an experiment and I said, okay, I'm going to tell a simple story. I used my brother as a character. And my brother was, uh, he'd been institutionalized as a schizophrenic. So I imagined him getting out of the institution. And what he wants is to not be, is to pass, to pass, so that people don't think he's crazy. And in order to do that, he wants a couple things. He wants a girlfriend. He thinks a girlfriend is going to make it so people don't know. And in order to get a girlfriend, he needs to be able to drive a car. That's all I did. That story got me into an MFA program. I wrote it, you know, so what I learned from that is you immeasurable. Should... Is, is 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 that story uh, available someplace uh, we can take a look at that's my that's my earliest story and i um i think i did yes i i i published that um at the alaska quarterly review so yeah if you let's talk a little bit and i can put some i can put some of my work up and then you can see that story is a good one because i mean that's me you know, I, I thought I was a genius, of course, but I was just starting my writing career, right? And, uh, and the first version of that story was not exactly the one that ended up being published, but the bones of it were, that, were, were established okay. there. And it was, yes, exactly an experiment. Perfect. I, um, uh, yeah, uh, definitely would love to take a look at that. And I think you've uh, made, uh, you know, some suggestions that I think I want to try out in the next few weeks. So thank you, Otis. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I saw the rest of, sure. your, uh, of your comments also. So, you know, those are great. Okay, uh, thanks. The, and then the other thing, I mean, in terms of this being a boot camp, and I know that you're, I mean, you're not here enduring all this talk from me without being serious about being a writer. So then it, it really, it really comes, it's like, I mean, you know, you can think about it as like, it's like going to the weight room and you really want to be stronger. Well, you got to pick up those weights, you know, and, uh, and that requires this little extra effort to actually do it. And that's, and I would very strongly suggest, I w I've done this often. I've just wrote experiment, experiment. Okay. It's a piece of garbage. I'm not worried about it. Okay. You can read, you can, I mean, <laughs> I've had people tell me that they, that they hear me on their shoulder saying the crap that I say, right? But you know, they like, oh, this experiment. Who's the protagonist? Boom, right? Um, who's what's the antagonistic force? Boom. Put them on the page. Why do I care about the protagonist? Just make it an experiment and do it. Um, you can right. throw it out afterwards. Perfect. This is the next. This is the next level of, because what we're really doing, the gauge of good writing, the gauge of our good writing is in what we make the reader feel. When the reader right. reads our work and they feel something. Ron brought up Moby Dick. Why did Moby Dick, why is Moby Dick so popular? Not because of his first line, I don't think. It's so popular because a boy who was 12 years old felt something as I walked into a boarding house and had to get in bed with Queequeg. That's why that is successful. You know, uh, why the, what I, number of books that I think are, are great, but maybe one of the greatest in American literature is The Great Gatsby. 
when I read the final paragraph of The Great Gatsby, I am feeling something. And I was, yep. you know, I read that back in the days when I was trying my best not to feel anything. Now I try to feel stuff. Um, okay, so yes, basically the issue with this with this piece is I don't know who the protagonist is, so I don't know what's going to. Then I'm not. I have no way of knowing what it is that I want throughout the piece, and you know I I and I also know that there can't be a resolution since I don't have an identified character that's going to be going on a. It really is as simple as a journey. I hate this kind of cliched language, just like you do probably, but a story is a journey in time that's filled with modulated emotional experience of whatever length. If it's a poem, it's this long. But if it's a, you know, a short story, it's this long. A novel, it's this long. A series, this long. It's always going to be a modulated mo emotional experience um, that is going to result in some kind of when I say journey, that means it has a starting point, right? A, and an ending point. It's not a non-journey in which we're just going, right? We must, we don't go from A to right. A. We must go from A to B. If we go from A to A, we failed. And I've wasted my time as a reader. I've now gotten to the end and I'm like, but I haven't gotten anywhere. There's, there are exceptions to this in printed literature because, and usually from my point of view, because they've managed to do something else. Kafka's Metamorphosis, for example, is yeah. not a journey from A to B. That, that story is a story that I would call, um, it, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a metamorphosis story. We go from here Okay, I wake up as a cockroach and I end up dead. But I want to point out for you that I wake up as a cockroach and end up dead is a monotonous experience that just goes from bad to worse. That is yeah. not a modulated experience of a story. The same thing if a character turns out, you know, you know well, I was going to say, I, was, I went to Scrooge for some reason, but, I, but anyway, uh, a story of just uh, accelerated transcendence, you know, I've learned this, I've learned this, I've learned this, I've learned this, etc., and now I'm at th this new enlightened state, that's also basically a monotonous experience. We actually do a trick, we have the character seek what they want, in seeking what they want and not getting it, they are tested and tested, and then... When they're here, right, which I we can say when they go into the valley of death, you know, like we've seen it many times. OK, um, my 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 famous my my best go to example is Oedipus. Oedipus actually goes into Hades. Right. So anyway, the, the valley of death and then we come out, we've we've tried to get what we want in the material realm. And we rise up getting what we need, usually in a sense of spiritual, in the spiritual realm. Right. If we want to divide it like that. I personally don't divide it like that because I see merger between the, the, the physical and metaphysical. But I think we capture that merger in a sense in, the, in, in story. I mean, so. Okay, just a quick hit list. So another, another thing, this is, right, this is boot camp. Okay, we have a scene that takes place in a car. Not confusing, potentially monotonous, right? It's not, here it isn't even established. We know the reader wants to go into a world, and this is, this is a, a, you know, this is a place where we can really shine. I learned this lesson. I always attribute my lessons to various people. This is the way I remember things. I attribute this lesson to Adam Johnson. So he teaches for Stanford now. We were in the workshop at Stanford together. He won uh, a um, Pulitzer Prize for his novel, The Orphan Master's Son. Okay. Adam Johnson in the workshop never held back on anything. He never held back on anything. Every choice he made 
he made in order to tell the best story he could make. So if we could have, um, if, if our setting is a car, Adam Johnson would be like, no, I don't want it to be a car. I want the setting to be a spaceship that is about to crash on Jupiter. That's inflamed and what are malfunctioning. I mean, he didn't write a story like that, but I'm just saying that he's, he's saying, you know, in a, so this is where we, Rom, yes, we want to get that reader, but we're in, we are in competition with other writers who also want to get that reader, who are also working with the same basic principles that we're working with, that they want to go into a world, that they want to know what's going to happen, and that they want to be fulfilled by the experience. So other writers also have their eye on that person, and they are not going to hold back. Right. I'm, I need to get the reader, I need to do at least what Adam Johnson does. And I would be a fool not to. If I want to actually get the reader, I'm not in competition with Adam. He's trying to get the reader, but I'm also trying to get the reader. So I better do the things that make it so I can. Right. These are just, they're all, because remember for us, we're writers. It's all choices. And really it's choices that you might say, well, I'm writing fiction or nonfiction. It's choices about what we are going to spend our time in, on. Sorry, what we're gonna spend our time on. We have a limited time in our life. How are we gonna focus it? Got to it. get what we want, which is to get that damn reader. Am I gonna spend my time, right? So we make a choice. And we want to make start making these choices, right? Let's make them ahead of time before, because even though typing, you know, five pages doesn't is not hard for us, that's still 15 minutes. My 15 minutes is valuable to me because I can write another five pages that are better than those five pages right away if I make good choices before I start typing. Correct. Right? It's yeah. really easy to make choices. It takes Sorry, time to uh, type. Time yeah. check. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so but thank you. But not... thank you, Otis. This is this is uh, uh, very very helpful. Okay, I'm going to. I think this is the one we already looked at. We looked at that one. Uh, that's the glossary. This one, I want to. I really want to thank you for you know whoever supplied me with this glossary. These are two terms that I'm I've now embedded in my mind and I'm going to be using in my own work. Okay, bimba murti and mantra murti. Okay, those, the, 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 the Murti in the physical form and Murti in the symbolic form. This is really huge. Okay, so, um, and actually it has a lot to do with our work. Okay, so, right, we might, remember we're talking about the story and we're emphasizing these abstract things perhaps up here about the individual ego versus the rest of the world and that essentially a maturation process Right? That's what every story is a maturation process. Every story is, I say, every story is a, you know, a coming of age story where we have an experience and we arrive someplace. Every story is a love story. And it's a love story between these two difficult things, the protagonist and the antagonist. They come and they merge at the end of story. Right? Um, but we use... We use the uh, bimba murti, right? We use the bimba murti. We need the physical thing to represent this abstract truth of life, right? The abstract truth of life is not intelligible to us. We use physical, right? Um, I don't know uh, if it's true of the Mahabharata, there, but, but it's true of the Iliad and the Odyssey that they have this thing called the Homeric epithet, which where you say, uh, brave Achilles, because bravery is abstract, but Achilles is not, right? Wily Odysseus, you probably do have it, because to me, I think some of these ancient stories helped us understand abstract principles by concretizing them, basically concrete. So they made physical abstraction, and that's what we also do in stories. But we make it physical because, remember this reader, understands the world in a physical way. The 
this is why. So we make it physical. We can't understand just the abstractions. If I yacked on to you about bravery and what it means to be brave, you'd all be snoozing. But if we make physical conflict to illustrate abstract principles, then we're engaged. Um, Parents, this, uh, this thought, uh, as you mentioned in a uh, recent uh, movie I saw called Barbarian, where a Roman, uh, Roman character, who's a very interesting character, who talks about fighting about a war, why we should fight a war, but he was a critical person who was doing this monologue, which is like wonderful. And I believe that I, I could really relate to, when, when you were saying that, I could really imagine that person in my mind. Right. Well, it, so, so a person talking about fighting in a war is not going to be as good as fighting in the war. Right. So but if the person talks about it in such a way that they can bring you into feeling like you're there, then that's going to be much more engaging. There yeah, was, I mean, the war was fought here and he was uh, he had betrayed someone and he was talking and he was retrospecting uh, like why did he do what he had done? So that was a very beautiful, uh, like it, it, it flashed my mind's eye as you were talking. Right. So there have been times, so even like that quick one, I've, I mean, I probably already underscored that. I read that when I was 12. Okay. So I still remember that scene. It's in my head as if I've lived it. What can I tell you about rendering whale blubber? Very little. Right. You know, there's, there's, there are other scenes. I was once describing to people, I, you know, for some reason, cockfighting, you know, chickens fighting each other came up and I was holding forth about what it's like at the, at the cockfighting arena. And then later I left and I felt like kind of queasy. I was like, I've never been to a cockfight. I'd read about it from Nathaniel West. This is what I mean about making the reader have experience. They want to have an experience, not read about one. Make them have it. And then they will never forget it. We're dealing, well, we can talk about dealing with memory later, but. Okay, let's read a little bit of this piece. Uh, maybe we can just read to uh, here. It's uh, Savita here. Savita present. No, I don't okay. see Savita here. Maybe we can move to the next one. Okay, I will just say something here, though. I want to make a point out of this. Um, all of your works are just object examples for us to learn from. All of our works are going to always be that. They're an ability to put something manifest on the page. Okay, so we're doing something important. We're taking something out of our brain that we feel passionately about. I am not discounting the fact that, um, you know, we, that first five pages, it might not be a story, but we feel passion to give our lives over to writing it. We need to find out why we feel that passion. Okay, so I, so I just want, you know, and then as we draft and we work on our story, we are always representing our passion. There is something there we want to do, and I want to honor that, you know, your, in you, your passion to write these, these things, but to find and distill you know, what is really at issue. So even though I might say this doesn't, you know, this isn't a story, doesn't mean that I'm trying to actually squash your passion to write it and make it a story. Because I believe in that. I believe that that is a real thing. I want to just say here that the writing here is very, um, very largely emotional. Okay, so, and this is, and this is the point I want to make out of it. And so we have the sun shimmered briefly like a misty halo over the jungle canopy. Okay, so we so shimmered briefly. We want to do our poetry like a misty halo over the jungle canopy. Rolling dark clouds rumbled across the dusky sky, transforming the sunlight into an indigo haze. Does that sound like a realistic environment to you? Or does it sound like you know, kind of an imagined environment for me. And so I agree that there could be a jungle. 
There could be an indigo haze. There could be, you know, there could even be this halo. But what happens for me is that the language is so purposely emotional that it squashes my ability to actually imagine. We want to work with the reader, right? So this is one way I look at it. So throughout this piece, there's a lot of emotional language. The person is, um, has been, you know, injured. They've been poisoned. I think it's a historical story. Um, and, you know, bad things are happening to them. Okay, so the simple, the simple way to look at it as a story is, well, I, maybe I have a protagonist, but I don't see what they want. I mean, as, that sounds harsh, I know. You're probably like, the poor person has is, is been poisoned and mutilated, and, I, and Otis doesn't know what he wants. I'm sorry, you know. Um, but I need to know. Does, does he want to get a girlfriend? Does he want to drive a car? Does he want a hamburger? What does the character want so that I know when he does not get it? That's the story. Um, but we only have one person. I don't know what they want. And if I only have one person, I definitely don't have this other thing. The force of antagonism. If I don't, if I, if I don't, uh, if I have a character on the page, I don't know what they want. Therefore, I can't have any kind of defined force of antagonism that's preventing them from getting what they want. And therefore, I have no dynamic action. And therefore, I haven't risen up to this level. Okay, that's simple. The, little, the slightly more complex thing to bring up is that when we write a, stro when we write a story, we dramatize, right? right the, we, uh, we dramatize this abstract world with physical things. Um, we provide, right, we work with our reader because, because we're not just writing something for us. It's not, we, we don't just write a book and put it on our shelf. Our book only exists when a reader reads it. And, when a, and it only rises to a certain level when a reader reads it and feels things from it. So I'm going to say this. We put, we dramatize, right, physical things primarily so that the reader feels emotional things. We do not write the emotional things because then the reader doesn't have a job. The reader's job is to feel. The reader's job, let's face it, let's go back to my book. <laughs> okay, this is, this is a static thing. Nothing, this is nothing. It's static. I can start my fire with it. The reader gives the story life, and that life is emotion. I will suggest that we don't fill the page with our emotion. We want the reader to feel that. We put the things on the page that inspire the emotion. We do not put the emotion. So just keep that in the, in the background, you know, as you think. Again, going back to um, Ram, if we want to think about that reader that we want so much, right? They're coming into our world, right? We're making a compact, and they're in the world. They are a participant. They are not a block of wood. We have to make sure that they participate. We need to give them something to do. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm really being, I hope it feels okay. I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm, you know, if I taught undergraduates, you know, I'd have to worry about weeping and things like that. But I know that you are passionate about producing great stories. I know that. I know that from Kieran. I know, I, I know it from your whole group and all of my interactions with you. So I know that you're passionate and I know that you, you want from me, you want me to help you as best I can. I can only help you the way I can. Um, but I, if it seems like I'm, well, I'm just doing my best. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Aditi, nice to see you again. Um, 
we we worked together a few years ago. So, um, and you know, your your stories then, as they do now, they really. I, I'm sorry to go like big, like working with uh, Kieran and Indic actually has been a really great experience for me because um, this is this is one of the things that, like what you can write about as a group for me as an audience can be exceptionally fulfilling, right? So I'm an American, U.S., whatever, um, but you you no worlds that I do not. And Aditi, uh, you know, I remember from before, she brings me into worlds that I do not know, right? In which uh, Hindu gods can seem to be manifest, you know, in the world in a way that I don't know, right? So, and that is not a detriment by any means. It's in fact a great uh, strength of your work because Remember, I'm, I'm walking in with the willing suspension of disbelief. I'm ready for anything. You know, you can put me on Mars. You can put me in the center of the sun. You can put me in a car. You can put me in this world, in a temple, right? I'm up for it when I open that page. So long as when I, op so long as when I open that page, I become immersed in that experience. I have emotions about that experience. I... I care about the experience, right? And then I am getting something out of it. We cannot forget that. We are not in, in the world where we get to, I know we want to, I want to, stand here and tell other people stuff. This is what I love about writing. Writing is a true relationship of absolute equality. And if we don't recognize that, I mean, in fact, it's more than equality, because the reader has all the power, basically, to drop our book at any time. We cannot, we're not on a pulpit, we, don't, we can't push them up against the wall, no, no, no physical restraints involved. But anyway, I, uh, I, I, Aditi, I just wanted to tell you that, that I've, that I've actually always, I've really been changed by that experience of reading your work. Oh, thank you. It's good. so good to see you, Otis, and excited to be working with you again. Yeah. Um, so I just want to, you know, like to go to be super clear, like in the Adam Johnson, you know, what I learned from Adam Johnson, you create a world, you want to create a world that ideally that's, that's new for the audience, that they've never been to, but is still like their world. Right? You, this is a very fine line. Right, so it needs to be a new world, but they need to be able to have a reference point for it. And this is why we deal with the physicality, we deal with some very various things to help the reader feel like it's, remember, it, it's a verisimilitude. The story is like my life, but without the confusing and monotonous parts. It has, it, it reflects a conscious space that's intelligible to me like limited omniscience, but not omniscience, or first person or whatever. So it's very much like the way I live my life, but it's, it's also completely new. It's new and familiar at the same time. Um, so let me have you read a little bit of this. Is that scrolling, I hope? Yes. Okay, let me just, for the sake of time, I'll just have you read this, this short piece. Do you see it outlined in black? Okay, yeah. She chuckled softly. It sounded like the tinkling of silver bells. There were a handful of rishis scattered across the four corners of Parat who heard that sound in deep meditation and were enraptured by it, smiling in the midst of their samadhi. Our new caretakers are nice. The king is watching over us. He is building the temple in such a place where he can see us from his own palace. The people here are kind and devout. What is not to like? He closed his eyes with a smile. He could feel her presence more strongly that way. He combed his fingers through her hair and settled her on his chest, not with his stone-hewn fingers or her stone-hewn figure, but with their spirits that were encased within their stone bodies. 
They had been draped in soft spun cotton night clothes meant to cool them in their desert heat of this land of the kings. Okay, oh, sorry. It's a run, okay. yeah. Uh, <laughs> sandalwood, pa sandalwood paste had been smeared onto his forehead, cooling him into a state conducive to sleep. Okay, uh, wonderful writing there. Um, so um, in reading this story, I obviously preambled it a little bit, right? Um, this idea of me as the reader being able to understand somehow to, be, to, we have to bridge this distance between my understanding of the world and this world that I'm very much unfamiliar with. And I think that that was my largest difficulty with this piece in terms of being able to become involved in it. We do have some other issues. So this is just on the imaginative level of, can we, we're, it's sort of like, um, when we're talking on this level, we're talking about the ability of me, you know, I'm coming saying, I want to be part of this world. Can I be part of the world? And that's dependent on you and me, right? And you understanding what I need in order to feel like I'm part of this world. It's a, it's a reality that I'm not familiar with. You know, right now, I, you'll forgive me if I have anything wrong, but I'm just trying to, you know, there's a, a merger of these statues made of stone, but they're also sometimes able to, from the reading, able to move and communicate in ways that I can't really sort out for myself. Because I can't sort it out, then it falls to the state of confusion. But it's not really it's not really an issue of confusion. It's really that I'm not able to seamlessly integrate myself with this consciousness, which is, again, going back to it is a combination. What we do when we write something is we merge the consciousness of the reader and the writer. They merge into a single consciousness, one that the reader creates it with the words, and the right and the sorry, the writer creates it with the words, and the reader creates it by reading the words. Um, and that's the place that that kind of keeps me out. And I think that it's maybe even a difficult job for you to figure out how to sort those two things. I think it is, but writers. So the way. The, the way writers really go up to the highest levels is they figure this stuff out, right? Writers take on problems. So this is a problem. We don't mind problems. Problems make us work harder, right? We want to have problems. And writers definitely take on problems and try to figure them out and try to make them work. And when they do that, I feel they write to what's termed a tour de force. Um, you know, probably a great example of this in a longer work is uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, A uh, Hundred Years of Solitude. He's dealing in, in some ways with, with, with worlds that are like yours, you know, this magical realism or however you want to phrase it, you know, something that's beyond it's beyond just the physical capabilities of the world as we understand it. And he draws us into that world and he writes this, this work that is, you know, a tour de force. I mean, it's one of the best books of, I guess it's the 20th century now, right? So it's one of the best books of the 20th century, in my opinion. Um, so that's not a bad, I mean, just knowing a little bit of what I know about your style, that Gabriel Garcia Marquez might not be a bad uh, influence. Now, it's true that after Marquez, everyone started writing magical realism. Of course, you can't do that, but you would do it with your own, you know, your own flavor and your own, you know, your own mm -hmm. sense. It would, it would be new, new to you. And we kind of have that here. But the, the slight difference is that I was able really to immerse myself in that world God knows how. I, I mean, I couldn't tell you. And and here I had too many blocks, right? Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't figure out how, you know, something that's stone can also move, 
uh, could also talk, uh, could also not be heard. Um, the, the moment that, that what I really liked in this moment, I don't know if this is your intention for this work, is at the end, so, so there, there's a combination of the metaphysical and the physical, which I could not make jive. That was the problem, right? Mm -hmm. Marquez doesn't do that. He actually makes the physical world behave in ways that the physical world doesn't normally behave in. I think that that's probably the difference. You know, mm -hmm. I remember when the, the blood comes up, it goes up the gully, right? And goes yeah. back to the source, right? So he reverses time in a way. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. Um, but I like, I like whatever's happening here as a setup, basically what, what can feel like a setup to get to uh, uh, Malati, maybe? Yes. So where, where she's here, and then she basically, she's a physical person now who has a physical quest. So I like that, and I like the idea that this early part kind of brings us to her sort of uh, spiritual um, understanding of what her quest must be. I really like that. Um, and I don't know if that's where the story continues. Um, but, but, but I, I did feel happy to be grounded, you know, with someone who I could understand in a physical way. And so <clears throat> that again goes to, we can think about point of view. So remember we have point of view, we have the antagonistic force that's also missing here kind of in the beginning. So I'm not feeling that dynamic tension, but this protagonist, this protagonist view, we have to be able to understand and care about, we have to know what it wants, et cetera, et cetera. And we have to be able to care about it. In order to care about it, we as the reader have to feel what I call a sympathetic resonance. Da, 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 da. Sympathetic resonance. You know, some people just say sympathy. I don't like that because I think that can mislead us like uh, saves a cat. It's not just distant sympathy. It's a resonance through sympathy. Like I liken it to, you know, we have a guitar and you can tune the guitar by, by taking a tuning fork. You can't hear anything from the tuning fork. That's like our words, right? But we put it on the guitar and an A comes out of the guitar. A sound comes out if it's in tune, right? We have to make sure that we're hitting, we have the right note, right? That can't be heard those words. And then we have to make sure, then, then we test it against the guitar and see whether we get that sympathetic resonance. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it's hard for me to do that, to have a sympathetic resonance. If either, if, if this God is a character or um, the female, I think the female consort or however it's termed, right? If either of those two are, are the protagonistic characters, if I can't understand them, I also can't have a sympathetic resonance. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, Right, and we have to think a little bit about then gods. My perception of gods can, might be a little bit different, but gods wanting something. Do they want something? Do they have that volition? And is there anything that stops them from getting it? These things, I don't know. Uh, you have to think about that if you want the gods to be a protagonistic force. Um, I, I think Malathi is the protagonist here because even for the gods, even though they may want something to feel at home in this new place, it's not like a big change from A to Z at the end of the story. So most of the change uh -huh. is in this girl who wants to bring this flower for him. So I think of the, the gods part as being more of the world building, but I still have to clarify in my own mind exactly how these rules work, which is why I think there's confusion because I haven't sorted out in my own head how to match the metaphysical to the, to the physical. Yeah, right. Right. So, and, and you're using a great term there, you know, how, you know, how the rules, what are the rules of this world? They have to be clear and understandable when they have, when they seem to have conflict or mm -hmm. I can't easily sort them out. You know, this is like, you know, like Superman, Superman, why does he have power? Well, it comes from Krypton, right? That, that's why we have these origin stories. Right, mm -hmm. so that we can understand and make sense of the rules of the world. Oh yeah, every everyone else is like this, but Superman is more dense, 
<laughs> right, right, and then he's vulnerable to Krypton. So, right, so like those are both important. He's dense, he's super, but he has also still has a vulnerability because mm -hmm. without any vulnerability, I would not be able to identify with him, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, I already really can't identify with him. So that's because he's, a, you know, one dimensional. I don't like his one dimensionality and I don't see myself as one dimensional, so I, I can't identify. But important to have those those base those base things done. But you might approach it somewhat differently. You know, you might figure this out. It might be a great setup, you know, this sort of that kind of magical world in the beginning of this and then moving to the physical. And then the the beginning of the story always predicts where it's going. Right, so I see something very interesting in that in terms of representing the divine world and then the physical world of this girl, because those might be the two forces in a sense that find some kind of union here. Um, mm -hmm. The beginning of the story, right, presents a problem. It's always, it must present mm -hmm. the protagonistic force and the antagonistic force. Um, this divine will might be the antagonistic force to um, Malati's protagonistic force. And mm. then we're going to have, then the story moves and it becomes a merger again. So it's like, believe me, my daughters hate watching movies with me. Okay, I better move on. Oh, sorry, sorry to be curt. I, I didn't mean to be So, uh, uh, quick time check, yeah. Otis. Uh, do, do you want to do maybe one more and call it, uh, uh, you know, call it a wrap or I think I, yes. I, I think I only have one. I think I only have one more, um, and someone will correct me if I'm wrong. So, um, so uh, is Abhishek? Uh, I don't think Abhishek, Abhishek. is online. Uh, if okay. I, yeah. So I think this is my, I think this is my last one. I will just say this is this is a polemic. Um, and right now, so I don't have I don't have a, I don't have a dog in the fight. If we're writing something that is going to make an argument, I'm going to strongly suggest that we write a thesis, and we have to represent both sides. We have to figure it out what it is that we want to say, and we have to put it on the page. If we don't, if we only put on one side, and this is the case with, you know, unfortunately, it's the case when we just have the protagonist who's, you know, cut, you know, his arms are cut off. The, it's actually the same issue, whether we're dealing with metaphysical ideas or we're dealing with characters and, you know, characters, if you only put one side on, then in a sense, you're trying to bully your reader because you're only giving them one side and that is not going to work. I'm not saying it about this piece or any piece. I, I, I say it about any piece. Yes, I you know, the poor person has their legs cut off and da da da, but if it's only one side, it's only one side. There's no there's no reader, you know, outside of people who already believe who agree with you who want to read one side. And if you want to talk to people who already believe with believe what you believe, my point my point will be you don't need to talk to them. Because you're not accomplishing anything. They already, right? The, the, I go by stories all the time. A, when it goes, a story is A to B. That means that someone is transformed and changed. That is what has to happen. Going from A, I already believe you to, I believe you even more, is A to A. Everything, story governs everything for me. It's not, it's not, it's not personal. Um, do the experiment. Get the two sides on the page. That's that's the, the main thing. And then and then it's a question. Now we're now we're actually dealing with stories. And now it's a question of how well we do that. How well we get the protagonistic force and antagonistic force on the page. That is the thing that takes us. Now we've written a story. Now we see how good it's going to be. Right. Um, and that's where, that's where the work is. I think that that covers it, uh, our time. Perfect. I'm so thank, sure. thank you so much, Otis. I think uh, we, uh, we covered, I think all, all the pieces there were, uh, there was one piece where I think the author was not, uh, uh, 
present, but other than that, we covered them. So again, folks, uh, send in your so. pieces. If I didn't, I'm... Sorry. I was Go just going to say, I apologize. I apologize if I, if I, I'm not a great multitasker, as you can tell. So there's benefits. I'm very focused. <laughs> you can probably see, but multitasking, I'm not so good at. So apologies. No, this is this this is great, absolutely. So, uh, folks, you know, do tell others also. The indicacademy.org website has details on how to send your samples, what format you should send it in a PDF format. About eight hundred words or so is a suggested length, and uh, do send it a few days in advance because for through December we will be doing this at the same time, which is Sunday, nine p.m. India time which is uh, 7.30 a.m. Uh, US Pacific time. So, and then Otis will, will send you the marked up feedback and uh, discuss those pieces as well as share other tips and suggestions and advice on writing that you just saw. So thank you Otis for your time and thank you everyone for, for diving in. Thank you so much. Thanks Otis. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Sleep well. Bye. Thank you Otis, that was great. Thank you.